Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. And we have a few updates for you. First, on our heating system efforts, we've heard back from about half of the 1,000 we surveyed due to reported damage to the heating system, with about 50% of them reporting their systems are still not working. The next step of this process is to connect those who need help with repairs with technicians. So we're sharing our list of those in need with both the Fuel Dealers Association and Efficiency Vermont, who have already begun reaching out to offer finding someone to do the actual work. As Efficiency Vermont outlined last week, they also have financial assistance available, and they're working with homeowners to connect them to the resources as well. To make sure we reach as many impacted Vermonters as possible, a team at the tax department has offered to help and started making direct calls to those who did not answer the email survey. Again, if you know someone who still needs their system repaired after flooding, please ask them to call my office at 802-828-3333 if they haven't completed the survey. Next, we'll have an update on the Business Assistance Program, BGAP, from Commissioner Goldstein, following the changes we made last week. As a reminder, we removed the cap and increased the grant to 30% of the damage for most. And for those who already applied or received their grant, they don't need to do it again. You will automatically receive another check if you qualify for more. And the program is not closed to new applicants, so you can still apply if you haven't already. Then Deputy Commissioner Batesy will give an update on debris removal, including work we're doing with municipalities and their stormwater systems. There's still a lot of work to do, and as we've discussed before, cleaning out storm drains will be critical before spring to prevent potential flooding that comes with snow melt. Lastly, General Roy will give an update on some of the headlines for FEMA aid. If you haven't already applied for individual assistance and you suffered damage in an eligible county, there's no reason not to. I know there's still maybe many out there who never bothered to put in a claim because you were concerned you were taking money away from someone who needed it more. But that's not how it works. In fact, leadership in Congress did the right thing by coming together, avoiding a government shutdown, and replenishing the disaster relief fund at a record level. So there's no reason not to apply and get this financial assistance. Again, General Roy will be more, give us more in a few minutes, but now I'll turn it over to Commissioner Goldstein. Governor, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to update everyone on the Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program, or as we call it, BGAP. Um, as a reminder, that $20 million program came out in August, and it was meant to help businesses, nonprofits, and landlords recover from physical damage that they suffered during the summer floods. Uh, we, um, we're, we're very motivated by the fact that this is helping businesses reopen, it's helping them recover, employees coming back to work, customers being served, tenants being served. To give you an idea on the numbers, uh, we've got 502 successfully completed applications in the system. 335 of them have been approved for a BGAP grant. 167 are still under review. The average BGAP award is now 22,424, and if you remember several weeks ago, it was as low as 13,000. So you were definitely seeing the results of the increase in the um, grant award calculation. There's $8.1 million that have been committed so far. And again, the difference from the last time I reported out, it was about $6 million committed. So we are seeing the differences. Uh, in the applications, organizations are reporting over $150 million in total damages, and $124 million is uncovered. And that's how we're calculating awards, is on that uncovered damage. Uh, we just started paying out the increase for people who were in queue to be reviewed. So just this week, I've seen some award 
approvals for area businesses, especially Montpelier restaurants, as an example. Prior to the new calculation, they would have received 20,000. They are getting six-figure six checks. So the team and I were very motivated by the fact that this is really having an impact. Um, it's been encouraging to hear about the increased amounts. For those who already received payment in the old formula, we will start sending supplemental checks next week. Uh, we'd like, also like to remind organizations we have about 100 incomplete applications, and we've sent a variety of messages over the last several weeks about what is wrong with the application, why it's incomplete. But if there's any misunderstanding or lack of clarity, please contact us at accd.bizfloodgrant at vermont.gov, and we will reach out and connect with you to take you through the application and what is missing or what is incomplete so that we could serve as many people as possible. We want to hear from you and work with you so that as many as possible benefit from the program. Thank you. I'm now going to pass it to Deputy Commissioner Batesy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Batesy. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. I've been asked to give you a brief overview of the debris removal process. Uh, the damage of the July flood created an unprecedented challenge associated with debris. When the waters receded and uh, our citizens literally dug out, we were left with mud and silt and construction debris from flood damaged homes and businesses and a variety of trash and organic material that washed away and was deposited in different locations by the flood waters. From the uh, early impact assessments, it was very clear that the debris presented a health and safety hazard and needed to be removed immediately. We should start by recognizing uh, the outstanding work that local municipalities did to remove debris. It was their crews that did the lion's share of this work. They logged countless hours uh, to meet the extraordinary challenges of the debris in their communities, and oftentimes this work was, <clears throat> excuse me, was unrecognized. So we want to make sure that we. Uh, we recognize them this morning. Um, however, it became clear that those teams needed some assistance right off the bat. And uh, for that reason, from the start of the, declar the Declaration of Emergency, we uh, convened uh, a task force at the State Emergency Operations Center. And this task force team represented a diverse mix of the state enterprise. Uh, the team represented uh, Vermont Emergency Management, the Agency of Transportation, the Agency of Natural Resources, the Agency of Digital Services, among several others. And we really had two functions, find the debris and remove the debris. To find the debris, we first turned to the local emergency managers and town officials. They identified areas of need and specific requests for assistance. Uh, the task force took in over 300 individual requests for help. Um, we also recognized that there were more challenging areas of need, such as less populated rural areas, uh, and also citizens that required a certain degree of particular help. For that, we turned to several uh, emergency medical services across the state, especially those who helped us during the pandemic and we knew had some of the capacity that we could utilize. Uh, in particular, Rescue Inc. in Brattleboro, Waterbury Ambulance, Middlebury EMS, Regional Ambulance in Rutland, and Glover Ambulance all became scout teams for the State Emergency Operations Center to help us find those areas of need. These teams used their close connections to the community to work with citizens and connect resources like volunteer groups and uh, volunteer efforts to help citizens navigate some of the debris removal process. We also use these teams to drive literally hundreds of miles of our waterway to help us scout problems with debris at bridges and culverts. Uh, we'd like to extend sincere appreciation for all of the work that they did. All of this information and the intelligence that we received on debris was routed to a central spreadsheet managed by the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, to man uh, they, uh, from there, the, uh, they assigned removal assets from a variety of different sources. To manage the initial large-scale debris piles, and you can imagine those are the ones in Montpelier and Barrie, the big piles, uh, we used a, a pre-contracted vendor the, these vendors were contracted with the State Emergency Management Plan prior to the flood. Uh, Ceres and Tetratech were the two that we used. Uh, they serviced communities throughout Vermont and carted over 5,000 of debris, 5,000 tons of debris. We also added the Agency of Transportation Resources, led by their flagship truck nicknamed the Bounty, as in the quicker picker-upper. 
Uh, AOT Resource also logged hundreds of miles and moved many tons of construction debris and vegetative matter. Their work is ongoing and will continue for a while. Uh, I'll be glad to share some specific numbers around the debris uh, that they've moved, if you, that would be helpful later. Uh, the task force also identified some unique challenges with debris, including uh, flood debris on private property, uh, as the governor mentioned, clogged storm drains in communities, uh, and also debris within the channels of the river. Uh, right now, we're working on uh, a variety of different solutions, including working with local municipalities. Uh, on the storm drain issue, what we're trying to do is identify those communities who need some help. Uh, many communities are able to manage the situation themselves. Some have their own back trucks. But uh, when they don't, we have contracts with vendors who can aid their assistance. So if they're identifying and we're working with them with our emergency managers uh, to help identify those areas of need. Um, in fact, today, the Agency of Natural Resources and FEMA are also out on a bit of a field trip. They're uh, visiting a variety of river sites to help identify uh, debris challenges there. The goal is to develop a plan based upon our river engineer's recommendations to ensure that the debris problems of today don't become problems in the spring when we have uh, you know, the ice out. As of this morning, we've brought uh, our original list of over 350 identified debris sites down to about 11, uh, although admittedly that number is dynamic. It changes all the time. We will add more uh, in the future. Uh, we still have uh, some unique challenges like large washed out culverts and river issues that I just spoke about, but the task force is working on the creative solutions that we need. To date, we've moved 12,010,000 pounds of flood rate related debris and 1,987 cubic yards of vegetative debris. That's not including the work of local municipalities. For all this success, however, we know there are ongoing challenges. Uh, towns and cities have had their hands full for a very long time. Uh, there are also homeowners that are still in need of assistance uh, or waiting for FEMA reimbursement before they begin their renovations. So this means that our work will continue. Um, if there are debris-related concerns, we urge citizens to contact their local municipalities first. They most of the time have resources. If those municipalities need additional assistance, they can contact us through their, uh, through their local emergency managers at the State Emergency Operations Center, and we can extend some help. Be happy to answer your questions later. But thank you. I'll turn it over to General Roy. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, the uh, uh, FEMA staff continues to work uh, both public assistance and individual assistance here in Vermont. Uh, we've just uh, passed $20.8 million uh, in individual assistance. Uh, and our current estimate uh, before we've completed all the work with AOT and BGS is about $123 million uh, for public assistance, and that's growing. Uh, more than likely, it will uh, eclipse uh, Irene, which was uh, over $200 million uh, for public assistance. Um, <clears throat> the deadline for individual assistance applications is October 12th, uh, so just around the corner. Uh, we ask uh, that anybody who has had uh, damages from the storm to please apply. We did extend the period another 30 days, uh, so we did some analysis, and from the 13th of September, uh, until I think it was three days ago uh, when we uh, completed the analysis, um, 156 people applied for assistance. And of those 156 people, 64% um, of them were eligible for assistance. And the average uh, award grant was $4,000. So there are still people out there who have had damages. And we asked, you know, anything you can do to help us get the word out to apply for assistance, please do so. We still have three uh, disaster recovery centers that are open. Uh, we have one in Ludlow, uh, we have one in Barrie, and we have one in, in uh, Waterbury. Uh, we ex we're ex extending uh, uh, all of them beyond the end of the uh, registration period of October 12th. Uh, we're extending uh, Ludlow out, I think it's to the 19th of October, uh, Barrie to the 27th uh, of October, and uh, Waterbury to the 14th of October. Uh, and again, the purpose of the disaster recovery centers is really, while you can sign up there, the really the, the purpose for those is to go there to receive assistance if you received a determination letter 
that there is a, challenges with your application or they you need additional work uh, on it or, or documentation. Uh, so we wanted to keep those open. For the one that's in Barrie, uh, we're moving that. It's currently at the auditorium, uh, and we're moving it to the Community Resource Center uh, on, I think, at the 12th of October uh, is the current date for that. Um, and uh, as the governor said, uh, the immediate needs uh, funding was lifted, uh, so we've been able to start obligations for things other than individual assistance, uh, which is great news uh, for, uh, for Vermont as we continue to work with all the uh, towns and cities on the public assistance requirements they have. Uh, and then lastly, um, at uh, 220 today, I think you're all probably tracking, uh, but uh, we'll all receive uh, a notification on our phones, uh, uh, emergency alerts, a part of the emergency alert system. Uh, so it's been well publicized, but just want to use this opportunity to once again ensure people got the word uh, that it, it's not an emergency, it's just a test of the system. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to the governor and stand by for questions. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, General Roy. Uh, we'll open up to questions at this time. Wanted to clarify something really quickly. Uh, the deadline to apply for individual assistance is going to remain October 12th, right? Yes, ma'am. Sending some recovery centers. Yes, we are. Yep. And and if somebody misses that deadline, and there's extenuating circumstances, uh, they have up to 60 days to come forward with a, a request and and the you know extenuating circumstances why they they couldn't apply. Okay. Can you just describe a little bit more? the types of people that seem to be coming in here at the last minute, sort of with these smaller sort of requests, did they not know that they were eligible? Have they just been taking time to process the, yeah. uh, the information? Uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't capture why you didn't come in, because it's kind of intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, we just you know, open the doors, say, you know, come on in, whether it's disasterassistance.gov or the 1-800 number, or they come to the DRCs. Uh, I'm just glad that over 156 people have come forward and I'm hoping that we, you know, anybody who has had uh, uh, challenges uh, applies. I think a lot of times it's words of mouth, right? You know, somebody applies and all of a sudden, you know, after, you know, they get assistance and say, hey, listen, I, my, flood, my basement was flooded and, and I didn't think I qualified. Um, but I did and I got X amount of money. I, in fact, I had a similar incident when I was in a uh, uh, local gas station. Um, the, per the clerk working there, I said, hey, how'd you fare? They said, oh, we got a little bit of, you know, stuff in the basement, but, you know, we don't really qualify. I said, well, call us, and you never know. Next time I ran to them, say, hey, we got some uh, clean, you know, and sanitized money. So so you never know, right? And the reason you're keeping the, the centers open after the application deadline is to help people with their applications y yes, sir. following that? That's a great question, because uh, a lot of times people will request assistance, and, for instance, they, they may have insurance. And so they get a, a determination letter saying, you know, uh, we're unable to provide funding at this time because, and then it'll give a list of what, why, and it's like, you know, we'll need to see what your insurance is before we can make a determination on how much you may be eligible for. So things of that nature, there's a number of, of different types of, of letters they'll receive, and the purpose of the disaster recovery centers is to be able to have somebody there you can look eyeball to eyeball with and say, I don't understand this, can you help me understand? All right, thank you so much. While you're up there, General Roy, um, where do we stand with FEMA in the city of Montpelier for the direct housing program and the trailers? And you also mentioned last week there's maybe a potential location in Springfield, I believe is what you said. Do you have any updates on that as well? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so for the city of Montpelier, uh, I believe this Friday uh, we're coming together, uh, and I think we'll have the lease uh, signed. We'll take a look at some of the infrastructure. We also were working with them on the footprint as to where it's located. You know, uh, as you may be aware, there are housing plans for the golf course, and what we want to do is we wanted to make sure that we weren't impeding the opportunity for them to continue on with that effort while we're taking care of the folks who needed assistance with the, the uh, mobile home units. Uh, so we now have a footprint. Uh, we've drawn out our, uh, our how we will lay it out. Um, the city uh, and the state are, are in concurrence that that will work. Uh, there are discussions about the, the size of the piping for water and wastewater uh, that are required for it. Uh, but I believe by this Friday we'll have that resolved. Uh, and then uh, we've already laid the contract for, uh, for the work to be done. 
Uh, so we, we're hoping that we'll be breaking ground on the infrastructure work uh, in a very short period of time and get people in before hard, cold weather hits. And the, the location in uh, Springfield area, it's a commercial park. Uh, and so there are pads available there. Uh, if people are interested right now, we don't seem to have anybody who's interested in, in going to that specific park. And when you said cold, hard weather, you mean like January, December? When are you thinking? We, we, we are still shooting for, for December time frame, as we all know with construction. And the number of units or number of people you think? 36s right now is the number we're looking at. The population we started with working with for direct housing was around 54. Uh, it's now at 41. Uh, as we spoke about before, right, you know, the longer it takes to get things done, people find other type of solutions. Um, so right now we're still looking at 36 units for the, uh, the, the golf course, uh, Montpelier area. Is that 41 statewide? Uh, 41 statewide, yes, ma'am. I, I, think, I think it's like five, five, and, and, and then uh, I think uh, uh, it'd be 31, I guess, right? So, I'm sorry, is it units yep. or people we're talking uh, about? I'm sorry, uh, applicants, yes. Uh, Washington, uh, so for Washington County, is a big number. Thank you, sir. Um, and then the smaller numbers for Memorial and, uh, and Windsor. Great, uh, thank you. Oh, no. Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, I have a question. I'm hoping that you could elaborate a little bit on what you found from the survey of people uh, with damaged or no heating systems. Um, you mentioned you've heard from about half. So I guess, how many people do we know right now don't have a functioning heating system? Yeah, right now, right now, it's about half of the original half. So about right 200, 200 and something uh, that don't have heat. Um, so that's the number we're dealing with. We don't know what stage they're in right now. We don't know if they're um, in contact with a, a contractor, uh, but we're. We're diving in a little bit deeper to get all that and, and make sure that the fuel dealers and the efficiency Vermonter have the same information so they can help us assist us in making sure we get heat to, to people in Vermont. Um, do we have any um, new information about um, how well the efficiency Vermont program is working? I don't have the information on that, uh, but uh, we should probably have Peter Walk come back in at some point when we get the rest of the survey results and, and see what they're able to do. I know it was a big concern, you know, coming out of the storm. Will we make sure that everyone has heat before the winter, right? Um, are you confident that that will be the case, or I, just do you remain? Concerned. Yeah, I remain concerned. Um, that's why we put the survey out um, and trying to get the assistance of uh, fuel dealers and, and uh, others to make sure that we're putting people in touch with those who are impacted. I felt that there was a gap. And uh, just anecdotally, I felt there was a gap. And so uh, we're trying to bridge that gap now and making sure that we get to them just as quick as possible. But I mean, it's still doable. but. Um, but as we've seen, you know, the temperatures uh, elevated in the past week or so, but they're going back down next week. So it's a concern. What are you, and then I'll give up the mic, but what are you finding are the biggest problems? Just finding people who can do the work or are people That, that I don't know. I mean, we, we, we haven't, I haven't gotten into the survey uh, far enough to know whether it's supply chain issues or it's the actual technical support uh, and the actual trades people to do, it, to do the work. Um, so that's why we're trying to analyze that and get the fuel dealers in efficiency Vermont, uh, get their uh, feel as well and their feedback. So of the original 1,000, only about 250 still don't have heat that we know of. Or is it just that that's how many people have like affirmatively said I don't have heat? Right, those are the only ones that have affirmatively uh, said that they don't have heat or complete heat. We don't know what stage they're in either. They may be somebody working on on their um, issue, um, but uh, but that's out of you know we have 500, so we have a thousand we put out, 500 responded, and then half of them said we don't have heat. So we don't know if that's it or or whether there's more. Thank you. That's why it's really important if if you know someone who doesn't have heat and if they haven't fill out the survey, call our office at that 828-3333. 
I can follow up on that. Sure. Um, so, Governor, at the beginning of this, you granted yourself, I think, is probably the right way to say it, some powers to streamline certain permitting requirements and other things. Have you considered, or do you think it would help to have some sort of expedited ability to repair systems without permits or without anything like we'll, that? We'll do whatever. We, uh, that the emergency order is still in place, right. and we still have the ability uh, to waive whatever restrictions stand in the way of someone getting heat. So, if there are restrictions. Um, we will do whatever we have to do to make sure that we alleviate that. Do you think that might be one of the holdups? I mean, I remember getting someone to look at my heating system, and it, it, it involved setbacks and things and lots of complicated sort of engineering. I don't, I don't, I don't know you would want to waive engineering requirements for safety, yeah. but maybe there's something. Yeah, it would depend on, on what the issue is. For instance, if it's a... Um, if, if it's somebody that was, uh, if we needed to get uh, more help out of state, for instance, in New York or New Hampshire, and there was licensing requirements or something, we could waive that. Right. Um, but, um, but certainly not safety. We would want to make sure that we work our way through that uh, to make sure that they were, they were safe. Uh, so, but I can't imagine what that is, to be honest with you. How hard would it be to waive the licensing requirements for out of state? Not, not very hard. Do you think no. you'll plan to do that, given the, what you've said about the severe lack well, of electricians and heating? Well, we don't know that yet, oh. right? I mean, in some respects, that's why uh, the fuel dealers have, have said uh, they have enough capacity, they have the people, uh, and that's why we brought them in and share the results with them. Um, because, And there may be in different parts of the state that aren't uh, interacting with those in Washington County were very hard hit, obviously, and, and uh, so, or Lamoille, or or others, so we just want to connect them first. We may, we may be okay, we just don't know at this point. Fuel dealers have said that they have sufficient technicians. They said they said they hadn't heard that there was any um, there was a sh any short supply uh, in terms of their their people, but people in in some counties may have not have reached out to them. And, uh, They've been saying for years that there's an acute shortage yeah. of people in those fields. So yeah, but to but to deal, deal with this. This disaster. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Overall, there's still a lack of tradespeople. Governor, statewide, there's uh, many, many leaf peepers and tourists that are coming. Fall foliage is, is popping right now as we speak. Uh, many of these buses are going to be stopping in Montpelier as well. What do you hope that that tourists and leaf peepers take away when they see some of the the damage in, in Vermont? Well, uh, again, there's. Uh, there's a lot of places to visit uh, throughout the state that weren't impacted, much like Irene. Uh, but I think having some empathy uh, for those who are suffering and going through this is good for people to see. Uh, but we are open for business. Uh, and we're optimistic that this is going to be a, a banner year for tourism in some respects. Uh, we, um, we still have, I don't, I don't believe we're peak everywhere in the state. And, uh, and I think there's still a, a lot of time left between now and sixth season. Um, Governor, uh, House Speaker Kerensky last month asked the Climate Council to focus on climate adaptation and resiliency. Uh, has your administration responded to that? And might it force uh, spending less money on emissions reduction? Uh, we haven't responded directly. I think that was in, uh, I think her, her comments were to the uh, Global Warming Solutions. Uh, well, the letter was to uh, Administration Secretary Kristen Clauser, head of the BCC. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure they, uh, they as the, the, the council, are, are, have, I don't know if they've responded or not, but we've talked about it. In fact, they were working on many of those same initiatives. So. I think they were going to respond. Do you have any perspective on the uh, debate over what are the steam heat in uh, in Burlington, the, the district heating from the McNeil plant, whether it's a good idea or not from a climate point of view? I, I, I can only give you my point of view. I think it's a great idea. I, I think it's served, uh, served Burlington well. I think it's serving Montpelier well, um, and I think it should be part of our our overall, you know, heating programs with heat. Thank you. Sorry. 
For Deputy Commissioner Bates, if you're speaking of debris, I don't know if you'll be able to speak to this at all, but considering we do only have the one landfill in Coventry, I guess, is that where most of the debris was going? Is there any concerns that it can handle it, or are we going to be all right there? Uh, it seems as though we've been all right. Uh, uh, we've certainly uh, peaked the crest of the debris. Now, uh, it's not saying that mission accomplished or anything, but um, they've, they've handled the bulk of what we've thrown at them, and there's no indication that they're pushing back against us. Uh, a lot of the debris that we have left now is vegetative debris, um, and we've been working with uh, a site down in Springfield uh, that is handling all of that and doing all of the grinding and the various things that are necessary to take care of that. So uh, I've had no indications that there's a problem, uh, but we'll keep an eye on it. You, you mentioned there's 11 areas, I think you said, that are we're still well, kind of working on. Where, where are some of the problem areas still geographically? Uh, they're, they're a little bit all over the place. Um, so our original list of, when we reached out to communities, the original list was 353, I believe it was. Um, we've worked through that list down to about 11, uh, but as I said before, it's a dynamic number. Uh, we get requests uh, on a regular basis. Uh, yesterday, AOT was in Johnson and took nearly 10 tons of debris out of Johnson, and that was just a, a coordinated effort by the communities, by the community there to reach out to homeowners who we're still doing some renovations. So, so those pop up from time to time. So 11 could be 15 tomorrow. It could be 9 tomorrow. Um, but that's about where we are. Uh, as I've said to the governor before, it's a little bit like playing whack-a-mole. Every time we, we sort of get a bunch done, more pops up over on this side. Uh, but we'll keep at it. Got a few folks on the phone. So we'll start with uh, Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Go to Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thank you. Uh, on a different topic, Governor, the News and Citizen has a story today saying that uh, Smokers Notch and Stowe or Vale Corporation at this time has uh, postponed any plans to try and build this uh, gondola connecting the two ski areas, mainly because of a lot of opposition from the uh, Agency of Natural Resources. So I wondered if you had a comment on that. Yeah, I had not uh, heard that, and nor do I have all the details and what they were going to do. It sounded like an interesting concept when I first heard about it, uh, but I don't know the area that they were considering, obviously, going over um, the, the upper elevation. Um, but, um, but I didn't know what the route was and what the difficulties were in doing so. Okay, one other question. Have you noticed, uh, and have you gotten uh, calls from anybody nationally in the media about the, the latest developments and the opening of the new beta technologies the manufacturing plant? I uh, have not. Um, I don't know, Joan, is there anything you've heard? No. No, nothing yet. Okay, there's been a couple of stories. It's been good to see that. Okay, yeah. thank you. No more, no more questions. I, I'm hearing that there may be a bigger, a big story, maybe on Good Morning America at some point, which will give it more attention. Excellent, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, I wonder if you have a reaction to um, the draft report that Mike Smith put out on Vermont State University. It's not surprising that they want to do a lot of consolidation, but it's still pretty sweeping, including um, laying off full time um, faculty, up, I guess up to 30, depending on how um, it, it works out. Any reaction to um, that draft report? Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't read the draft report at this point, um, but I'm not surprised. Um, we, they continue uh, to struggle, uh, but I think there is uh, hope on the horizon. Uh, and this is something, you know, the legislature had asked for. Uh, there was a, a lot of money that was put into the uh, Vermont College system, the state university. And, um, but there was also uh, the request uh, by the legislature to reduce uh, the amount of money uh, that was for overhead uh, and, and to try and get into uh, an area where they could be self-sufficient. So. It's no surprise uh, that that's uh, that there's some layoffs. Um, I look at it from a business perspective, and and uh, I look at students like customers. And if I have fewer customers, 
uh, I, and to survive, uh, I need to cut my overhead. And uh, and I think they have the same situation here. I mean, this is this is not something that's happened overnight. It's happened over decades now, and um, and they just have to cut their overhead in order to survive. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is bring more people into the state. And I think beta is a good example of how we're going to be able to do that. Uh, but we need more activity, uh, economic relief. We need to make Vermont more affordable. And uh, we need more families uh, to move uh, to Vermont. Because 90% of the students uh, at uh, historically at the Vermont college system have been Vermont students. They come from Vermont. Uh, so when we have fewer of them, it's, it doesn't take long to come to the conclusion um, that there are less students available. And so that's been, that's been their issue, and, uh, and they just are trying to, to come to grips with uh, being self-sufficient. I, I know you're looking at this from a, a distance, but um, would you um, be in favor of even closing one of the, the campuses? I think that's a decision they have to make on their own. Um, this is, uh, they're separate, they're out of our uh, purview in some respects, uh, but uh, but I think there's, there's a way to do this uh, in a structured way where you may not have to close a campus, but you're, you're going to have to find other uses for part of your campus that's not being utilized today. So again, I think that they're all contemplating that and um, We'll see what happens as a result of this uh, this report. Has a long ways to go. All right, thank you. No, thank you, Governor. Keith, the Rutland Herald. Uh, hi, I was wondering um, if anyone was aware of the current situation going on in Paulette with the uh, the Slate Ridge and the, the owner, Daniel Bonnier. My understanding is the Environmental Court had put out an arrest warrant for him the uh, time period for that arrest warrant expired without him ever being arrested. And I think now the court is saying because this is being appealed to the uh, state Supreme Court, they, they can't modify the order in any way. Um, I, I'm just wondering what anybody thinks in this situation, if there's anything else to be done here, if it's just, um, or what's going on with this. I mean, it looks like the, the court's authority is kind of being a little undermined here by law enforcement not following through for whatever reason. I, uh, I don't have any, um, I guess I, I'm not aware of, of what um, we could do at this point in time, uh, but we'll certainly look into it. I, I have heard and read uh, something about the, the situation, uh, but, um, but I'm not sure of the, uh, the details of that and what, it, what is even being asked at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Try Chris Roy one more time. Back to the room. Governor, are you uh, speaking of Slate Ridge? You, I believe, you signed a bill earlier this year uh, banning paramilitary camps. How how do you see that playing into the picture of, of where we we stand with uh, Mr. Bonnier? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think his contention is that uh, he doesn't fall under that jurisdiction. He's found uh, another way, or he's, he's at least that's what he's going to. Uh, the argument he's going to make to the court, I believe, is that he doesn't fall under that. But I still believe it was the right thing to do. Governor, so tonight in Stowe, we have a benefit concert where 100% uh, money is going to recovery efforts, even Oktoberfest later on, and a ton of events like that. So I guess just from your kind of helicopter position as governor, I guess what's it just been like the last few months watching municipalities, organizations come together to help the thousands and thousands of restaurants and businesses that have been affected? Yeah, well, it's heartwarming um, to see. And uh, people who weren't affected by the flood um, directly um, still feel a sense of camaraderie uh, to those who were across the state. And I think that that's part of the beauty of being here in Vermont, a neighbor helping neighbor, coming to the aid of those who, who need us at that time. And we've proven it time and time again, whether it's Irene or, or this uh, uh, July flooding uh, event, 23. Um, we're still seeing people coming together to help, but we still have a lot to do, right? And um, 
and I'm going to probably talk about this more and more uh, as time goes on in the next few weeks, but uh, there are still a lot of projects that could use the help of volunteers. Uh, I see a lot of projects when I go through either Montpelier or Barrie and so forth that just need some volunteer help people come together, and I, I know they're willing. They just need to know about them, so we need to, to, to bring that all together and, uh, and, and help one another out, one community uh, to another. The state's unemployment system, how would you how would you express or how do you feel about how it's responded to the ability to get money in the hands of people who've been affected by this flood? Well, I think in some respects, if you're talking about the DUA in particular or just overall, overall. Just, and you're talking about the unemployment system? Unemployment, or, right. Yeah. Um, the, the program that's set up, um, obviously, we are looking forward to the new IT system that will come into place, and that will be helpful in the future. Uh, but, that, but I believe that they did respond uh, in the way that we normally do uh, with, with uh, any type of unemployment activity. Uh, if you get laid off from your job unexpectedly, um, we respond. And, and in this case, I think we did as well. The DUA complicated things a bit, but it was a smaller number. Um, but we can always do better, obviously. We want to do better. I've, I've heard you express frustration in the past about how long it took to set up the DUA system. We're continuing to hear, though, from businesses who are expressing profound frustration that um, it's, it's taken them an extremely long period of time to get some straight answers to which program their employees ought to be applying to, and then um, they're running up against this uh, this need to continue to look for work. Uh, the employees need, there's a waiver period of 10 weeks, I think. Um, have, have you considered waiving this period of time where people have to be looking for work in order to get benefits? Because that's what, something we did during COVID, right? But I gather we haven't done that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if Commissioner Harrington is on. I might have him respond. but I. But I do have uh, a lot of sympathy for anyone, and we should find a way through this because anyone who is connected with a business that is going back, they just have an open backup, we should extend it, right? right. But to wave it across the board may not be the answer. Um, so strategically um, and maybe surgically, if we can do that, I'm all in favor. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have, for those who are unemployed at this point in time, not, not uh, connected to the flood. Uh, we need, we have, we have more jobs than there are people to fill them. So we have a lot of need out there in terms of filling those positions. So if you're unemployed right now, I, there's all kinds of opportunity out there, and we want to make sure that people are filling uh, those those jobs that are open. But for those who are impacted by the flood and are going back to the business that they they came from that just hasn't reopened. Uh, we should find a way uh, to to give them some relief. That's what I'm hearing. Is yeah. Part of the problem is this is sort of this uh, process where the business is trying to reopen on a certain time frame, but yeah. then they're just having extreme difficulty getting reopened, and it's creating this confusion about whether their workers can can avail themselves of unemployment benefits during yeah. in the interim. I, I, I feel uh, maybe a connection to. Ethan Allen, for instance, up in Orleans County, when I visited there, they had 300 employees, and and I know it was going to take, or they they um, they offered that it's going to take some time to open back up, and they didn't want to lose their employees because they're few and far between in that area, uh, but they're a major employer. Uh, so, so again, I I feel. I feel an urgent need in that particular situation, as I do with anyone who is impacted by the flood. So now we'll see what uh, Commissioner Harrington has to say. Hopefully it's all the same thing. Deputy Commissioner. Governor, oh. it's Deputy Commissioner Green, Commissioner Harrington, Harrington isn't here. Um, uh, we have extended uh, the 10-week return to work date um, for a variety of companies on a case-by-case -case basis. Basically, um, for the reasons that the governor uh, has has outlined, I mean, the reality is, is it's a it's a it's a date to make sure that statutorily um, 
companies in the past have kind of used uh, an extended uh, return to work date as, as kind of a way to game the system, and that's kind of the reason it's structured there. But we have worked with companies to extend that date or that that time period from 10 weeks to 12 weeks to, to sometimes 14 weeks uh, that have been in communication with us. And we would certainly love to hear from any companies um, who are who are interested in, in extending that date um, for, for the exact reason the governor just um, just outlined. We don't want a company to lose its workforce uh, because they were struck by a natural disaster. So that is something that we can do on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we haven't, uh, and the commissioner has, has kind of resisted uh, doing it holistically uh, across the system, but certainly any any company that's running into that return to work date we'd love to talk to them um you know it's not something uh that i think we're comfortable just waiving in perpetuity but if you know that it's going to take 12 or 14 weeks from that date um or or longer if there's a date certain uh, that's the reason uh that's the reason it's there so have to reach out to us uh and certainly we'll work to get that message out as well deputy commissioner degree call him so uh, last week uh, seven days publisher Paula Routley published a, an, an editorial saying that basically drugs and homelessness in Burlington are just broken and out of control and was looking at what do we have any new ideas and I'm wondering if on the state level are are there any innovations for either Vermont's uh, homelessness or, or drug problem that, that we haven't heard about yet? Yeah, I think we need to continue to do what we've been doing and just amplify that. Um, whether it's the drug issue, I think um, at the four legs of the stool, um, we need more prevention, we need more treatment, we need more recovery, and we need um, uh, we need more enforcement as well. Um, so we have to amplify all of that. Uh, the homeless situation is some something, you know, with our housing crisis, and then now with the uh, with our flooding has exacerbated the situation. And uh, we're trying to get um, we got all hands on deck, trying to do whatever we can to alleviate that as well. So I think those two situations. Um, we just need more more resources, uh, and unfortunately, we need more time that we don't have. And we just need to amplify everything. Bur Burlington Mayor Bro Weinberger has said that the uh, hub and spoke model hasn't been able to keep up with fentanyl and and other um, other challenges that have been facing the the system. I mean, how do you think hub and spoke is holding? Yeah, up? no, I think I think it is uh, part of the answer. Um, but uh, but I would agree fentanyl has taken over. It's taken over the country. It's not just here in Vermont uh, It's across the country and uh, we need to stem the flow somehow uh, And that may be more globally But um, but I would agree uh, fentanyl has changed the game And then as, uh, Xylazine I think is that I think that's the new newest one as well. That's that's impacted us. You know, in the face of rising overdoses, as you know well know, there are some people like Mayor Meyer Weinberger who are saying we need to change our approach, we need to try new things. You have, you continue to say as today, you know, we need to double down on what we have been doing. I guess, wh why do you believe that, right? That we just need to double down on what we are doing. Because we saw success with that program, with that model, um, in the beginning. And then, um, again, fentanyl changed the game. So my belief still is that it's the right approach. We just need to do more of it. And that takes resources, and it takes resources, including not just money, but people. And um, we're in short supply of people uh, in the state. We're having a hard time with our workforce, hiring, and, and so forth. So. And that's across the board. And in our health care system, it's it's become an issue. It has been an issue for a while, and it's it's good. It's getting worse, um, and that's why we've worked with our congressional delegation on this. Senator Sanders has taken this on. He was here last week uh, with another senator from Kansas, Republican, 
um, to try and work on our health care system. So I think we all recognize and realize that this, this is an issue that we have to confront, um, and there are answers out there, but some, some of the answers are what we've been doing already. We just need more of it. So uh, FEMA's disaster relief fund has been topped off. That's obviously a big relief to Vermont. Um, but you know, are you still hoping that the federal delegation will be able to get more? Right? Either yes. Uh, are you hoping for more? Yes. Than just okay. And what does that look like? Well, it's for major uh, projects like I've spoken about in Barrie, for instance. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there. Um, but we need to make sure that we have some funding to back that up uh, because I'm not sure that we can do uh, the scale of, of, of development that I think is needed in Barrie um, on our own. We need extra help, and that will mitigate the, some of these disasters in the future if we do this right. So um, there, Senator Sanders in particular, I've spoken to about this uh, a great deal, and uh, in fact, just the other day at Beta, uh, so we're going to continue to work together. We need to work with the city as well, make sure our visions align, and uh, so that we're all, all on the same page and uh, to confront this, because I think there is an opportunity here. We can make lemonade out of lemons uh, if we do this right, but we're going to need funding, resources to do that. But I think there's an opportunity, because they've, they've more than replenished uh, the disaster FEMA funding. So there's an opportunity to, for Congress to utilize some of that to mitigate in the future. Are you hoping for just additional housing money in general, I guess, or is it just, or is it just a development to vary? What is kind of the universe? Of what you know, you're I, I look at this as a you know, bigger universe, uh, and, and, you, and you think about how do we prevent the flooding in the future. I've talked about the volume uh, storing uh, the capacity to store more water in the future as part of the answer, and not building right on the riverbanks and extending the riverbanks, broadening the riverbanks in order to store more uh, water, flood water. And um, so, but this uh, all can be done connected together with housing and uh, buyouts and so forth um, to try and uh, replenish the housing as we, as we provide more storage capacity. So it could be done. Um, we should start upstream and um, and work our way through in some of these impacted areas that are historically um, vulnerable. Thank you. The Vermont History Museum is reopening really on October 10th. I'm just wondering what does that mean maybe for your offices, the Attorney General offices? Can we see you guys moving back to Montpelier around that time? Or? No, no, there's still uh, issues with the rest of the building, but they're on the first floor. And they're right out front, um, so they can reopen. And obviously, we have uh, tourism starting, so it'd be good to open that back up, uh, so that uh, so that people uh, that do come and visit, uh, bus tours and so forth, have a place to go along with our beautiful state capitol, so which wasn't impacted by the flood. But the rest of the floors in 133, um, I still have a ways to go. Um, did you see the story that estimated the cost uh, of $100 million to state facilities in, in Montpelier from the floods? Do you agree with that? And if so, where's that money going to come from? Is that all federal FEMA dollars going to help we rebuild those buildings? All, or we heard the where's the status? hope it's FEMA dollars. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, uh, we'll meet that threshold uh, of the $111 million uh, of public damage to reduce uh, the uh, what we have to to uh, put in um, the match money. Um, so that'll be reduced from 25 to 10 percent. Um, but uh, yes, I believe most of that will come from FEMA. What's your general reaction to that number? Uh, that's it's a, a huge number, obviously. Uh, but it's, it doesn't surprise me, uh, considering the damage that I saw. Yeah. And all the, I mean, that, that's what's different about this, um, this situation uh, than Irene. Uh, when we had Irene, Everything was somewhat visible, uh, about 40 bridges, I believe, structures uh, that were visible. And uh, not that it took a long time to rebuild them, but you could see them. 
this affected our downtowns more dramatically, affected more homes, especially in Barrie. When you look at the difference in the quantity of debris uh, from Barrie to Montpelier, for instance, and we know how hard Montpelier was hit, but I'd say there's at least twice the debris in Barrie uh, than in Montpelier. So that tells you the extent of this. Um, so it's all the hidden components uh, in, in the buildings themselves that are so expensive uh, to, to rebuild and recover. I guess, I mean, I, I understand your explanation about the need to go upstream and find ways for that water to be diffused and so the energy to be spread out. And to, but is there anything more you can say about what the state is going to do to actually find those properties develop those areas in ways that they can handle floodwaters, or is it just an idea at this point? Well, again, without without funding, it's just an idea. It's just a concept. It's just, it's, it's something that we can continue to do, uh, but it'll take that much longer. There's going to have to be buyouts associated with this, willing participants uh, to, to, to do this. Um, but, I, but I think there is I think there's an opportunity here, and uh, and I I look at this as the glass half full, and, and I think that it's doable, and um, if we have the funding, we can do it quicker. If we don't, we can still do it. It's just going to take longer, and it's going to be strategic. Well, what is your confidence level after what you've seen in Congress this week, and specifically the House of Representatives? Yeah. What's your confidence level? Well, one day it's it's higher than some other days. Um, but seeing that they came, uh, you know, I, I believe they did the right thing. Leadership in, uh, in the House, Speaker uh, McCarthy did the right thing in reaching a deal. Cost them his speakership, but, um, but that's what we all have to do. You know, we have to, we have to deal with the reality at hand and do for the greater good and uh, suffer the con consequences after. Uh, so. I'm hopeful uh, that uh, that they'll come together in some way, um, but uh, but we're seeing this division, this fracturing throughout the country, and uh, it used to be I, I've I've used this analogy before. It used to be that there was the pendulum uh, that went back and forth, you know, more liberal, uh, more conservative, back and forth like that. But now this pendulum is just broken right down the middle and it's going in opposite directions. I don't know how we, we need to bring it together um, because I think the vast majority of people across the country um, are more moderate centrists. It's the extremists on both sides of the aisle uh, that have the loudest voices and uh, obviously with a limited number of people have quite a bit of power when you have such a fractured government. Thank you all very much. I have one more question, if I could. Sorry, oh. sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, there was a story the other day in seven days about an individual from Plattsburgh who was banned from riding the ferry back and forth from Plattsburgh to Burlington where he gets medical care <clears throat> because he had sent a, an email to the company expressing his disdain for the company and for its monopoly over the ferry service in the, in the state. and. I guess I just wondered if you saw that and whether you had I did. I did not see okay. it. No. I, I, yeah, I don't have any details. Hard to comment on that before seeing that. Thank you very much.